Yeah. <clears throat> it's really, uh, it, it makes me happy. I'm honored to be here uh, again, so thank you for welcoming me, welcoming, welcoming me again. Um, it's, uh, especially, it's an honor to be introduced by um, Dr. Pedraza, especially today on his birthday of all days. It's a... Uh, oh. um, it's a happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brian. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we are a smaller group today, and uh, this is wonderful. I love small groups. I, I love teaching smaller classes. We, I'll just kind of treat this as a master's seminar, something like that. Uh, meaning that um, uh, if I'm mumbling or uh, if, so, if something came out and it was just totally incoherent, then just say, uh, could, you, could, you, could you repeat that? Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I might uh, skip some stuff, uh, mostly because uh, what I prepare, it, little, some parts of it are a little bit more technical, and maybe I'll skip that, but we'll see. All right. Um, uh, immigrants, healthcare, and the vice of Asadia. Uh, not my pre people, uh, not my problem. Uh, I, I had thought about maybe changing, uh, changing the title to something like, uh, let's see if this works. Nope. Uh, the arrow. Nope. It's okay. I thought about changing the title. I'll be your teacher. Thank you for my thanks. Uh, to uh, uh, welcome healthcare, uh, welcome uh, healthcare and the vice of Asadia, or maybe um, uh, people in need, merciful care, and the vice of, of Asadia. Um, <clears throat> the idea behind that was um, uh, Brian had asked me to. I mean, maybe try and, uh, and bring together uh, uh, immigration and, um, and, uh, and people who are ill, or alternatively, um, uh, uh, the welcome and the, the practices of health care. Um, and and and, but that was, it was actually a generative puzzle. I was, I was grateful for that. So part of what I want to, want to do today is I, 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 I want to reflect on the phrase, not my people, uh, not my problem. Um, in this instance, the, my main thing is to think about immigration, but this can be applied to all sorts of different avenues and areas. Um, it could be a, a, a matter of racism, a matter, a, a matter of nativism, a, a matter of, of uh, ability, uh, disability, uh, a matter of class, uh, class distinctions. So you've heard this phrase, perhaps you've uttered it. I know I've uttered it at times, um, uh, whether it's said out loud or whispered in our heart. Uh, it is an attitude and an outlook that's common in our time. Uh, not common in a way that's really new, but the uh, effects of this attitude are pronounced uh, uh, for a number of reasons. So it should soon become clear about what I think about this sentiment, uh, not my people, uh, not my problem, the attitude expressed in that phrase. Namely, I consider it to be an expression of that capital sin against charity called asadia, the vice of asadia. You might also know it by its other name. Uh, it's the deadly sin called sloth. All right, let's uh, the, uh, maybe go to the, uh, I'm going to do three points today. I'm going to give an overview of Catholic social teaching on migration and immigration. Um, uh, I'm going to then move on to uh, uh, a possibility of reframing the conversation uh, with the help of St. Thomas Aquinas and Pope John Paul II, too. Um, and I'm going to just tease out real briefly a parallel between care for the sick and the welcome of strangers. And there is a deep formal connection there. And then I'll, uh, I have some remarks that I'll conclude on the vice of Asadia and a particular kind of contemporary indifference um, that we might have a responsibility to address and navigate collectively. I'm going to go with the next one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just some numbers. It's always good to start with numbers with this sort of stuff. Uh, uh, these aren't the most recent. Uh, and, and a lot of what, I, uh, big parts of this, uh, of what I have to say about this, it relies on, on research from uh, folks who have been studying this a lot longer than I have. Um, uh, so I'm cobbling together a lot of different work here. <clears throat> All right, so just some numbers. Uh, 200, roughly 215 to 230 million people are currently migrating around the world. 
Um, that number is probably a little bit low uh, uh, post pandemic. I think we're probably looking at more like 270 million people are migrating, they're moving. Um, what this means is, is roughly about one out of uh, every 28, 29 people around the world is living away from their homeland. This is a big deal. One out of every 29, 30 people is living away from their homeland. Um, of those, approximately 50 million migrants are, have been forcibly uprooted or displaced. This includes refugees um, and those who've been displaced within their own uh, homeland. So these numbers, these figures, this reality, uh, this is part of, the, of what's affecting the United States today in the successive waves of migration into the United States. And the numbers and the needs of these migrants, um, they present pretty significant pastoral and practical challenges. Um, all of us are aware of this. So in the background of Catholic teaching on immigration are two basic doctrines. Uh, the first is that the human race, humanity, is one single family, symbolized by our common origins, uh, uh, our common origin. We're all creatures formed in the image and likeness of God, uh, but more than that, or in addition to that, or parallel to that, coordinate with that is what I want to say, uh, we also have a biological unity. Um, sin, uh, in the Christian view, has turned human beings against one another, uh, person against person, nation against nation, and in this way, this unity that belongs to us properly is not lived out in reality. Um, nevertheless, uh, the church and the teachings of the Catholic intellectual tradition insists that this is still fundamental to our nature. We are one family. And in Christ, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to live into and recover that brokenness, that woundedness of our family. The second core doctrine, the basic, uh, uh, basic principle, is that it has to do with the inherent dignity of every human being rooted in our nature as beings created uh, in the image of God. The dignity of the human person is the foundation of the church's social teaching. And as Catholics understand it, uh, society exists to promote this dignity, this graced position of the human being, every human being in the good order of God's creation. So going back to the 1960s, uh, in his encyclical Pachamin Terras, uh, Pope John the 23rd. Does anyone remember John the 23rd? Oh, he's my hero. He's your hero. <laughs> my hero. <laughs> he was a rock. He is a, was a rock star. Uh, pope John the 23rd. Uh, uh, he wrote Pachamin Terras, and in this document, he said that every human person has rights and obligations that flow from his or her very nature, and these include the right to immigrate and to migrate. In that document, the Pope uh, argued that the fact that a person that one is a citizen of a particular state doesn't detract in any way from that person's membership in the human family as a whole, nor from that person's citizenship in the world community. The Pope invites and challenges Catholics to consider our common humanity as prior to any sort of identification of national identity or citizenship or social location. Now, the Second Vatican Council, in the document Gaudium et Spes, uh, says something along these lines, uh, quote, the political community exists for the sake of the common good in which it finds its full justification and significance and the source of its inherent legitimacy, end quote. But as Pope John XXIII points out in Pachamin Terrace, the pursuit of a single nation's common good includes within itself the recognition that that nation is part of a larger human family, that that nation is part of a larger uh, 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 con conglomerate of nations, uh, as part of the universal common good, which consists in the promotion of the dignity of each individual. So the political vision of Catholic social teaching laid out in Pachamin and Terrace is what uh, some theologians, but more political scientists, political, political theorists would call a cosmopolitan uh, uh, political vision. Uh, through the principle of subsidiarity, uh, uh, individual nations remain the primary means of bringing about the common good uh, by means uh, of addressing the needs of its own citizens. However, Catholic teaching also recognizes that certain challenges to the common good, like um, economic trade, 
environmental collapse, uh, uh, that these things cross national borders. And because of that, agreements between nations become fundamental, very important, and more formal international institutions need to be part of this bigger political human conversation. Also, since we live in a system of nations that exists for the sake of the person, as Catholics understand it, special provisions must be made in particular for migrants and refugees as they move across borders and between nations, precisely because they're persons whose personal dignity has not been fulfilled in their own nation, and, and they've, they've fallen through the cracks. Um, Pope John uh, teaches that, quote, among uh, man's personal rights, we must include his right to enter a country in which he hopes to be able to provide more fittingly for himself and for his dependents, end quote. He adds that, quote, it's therefore the duty of the state, uh, of state officials to accept such immigrants, and so far as the good of their own country, rightly understood, permits, uh, to further the aims of those who may wish to become members of a new society, end quote. So this is that cosmopolitan balance uh, that, is, that we find in this document, the Pachamenteris. It's a balance between the rights of the migrant, the human rights of the migrant, and then the ability of the individual nation to contribute to the common good. Now, that balance is important because it comes up for us specifically here in the United States in our contemporary circumstance. That balance served as the basis for a detailed pastoral teaching that was uh, promulgated by uh, the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops and in, in collaboration with the bishops of Mexico in 2004. It's a wonderful document. It's a beautiful document. It's theologically rich. Uh, it's called Strangers No Longer. That's worth writing down. Strangers No Longer, together um, on a journey of hope. In that document, uh, the bishops outline a Catholic vision of just immigration reform. This is important. They outline a Catholic vision of just immigration reform, one that would prioritize people over profits, human costs over financial costs, and the development and dignity uh, of persons over the destructive and divisive rhetoric that degrades and dehumanizes. So there are basically five uh, bullet point principles, and you can Google this, what are, the, what are the five principles of strangers no longer from the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops? Um, uh, the teaching is summarized uh, like this. So basically, uh, persons have a right to find opportunities in their homeland. Um, per, two, persons have a right to migrate to support themselves and their families. Three, sovereign nations have a right to control their borders. Four, refugees and asylum seekers should be afforded protection. And five, human dignity and human rights of undocumented migrants should be respected. So in this document, Strangers No Longer, the bishops, they root their analysis not in models of political pragmatism or economic efficacy or cultural imperialism uh, or even cultural or national identity, uh, but most fundamentally in the gospel message uh, and Christ's proclamation of the kingdom of God. So like Pope John XXIII, uh, while the bishops of, U of the United States and Mexico maintain that a nation has a right to control its borders for the sake of the common good, they insist that the common good must be defined in a way that respects the dignity and rights of each person. And that, therefore, the presumption is in favor of migrants seeking a new life, particularly for relatively wealthy nations such as the United States. You can go ahead and go to the next one. Here's, a, here's one excerpt where this is illustrated. This sums it up pretty tightly. The church recognizes the right of a sovereign state to control its borders in furtherance of the common good. It also recognizes the right of human persons to migrate so that they can realize their God-given rights. These teachings complement each other. Though the sovereign state may impose reasonable limits on immigration, the common good is not served when the basic human rights of the individual are violated. In the current condition of the world in which global poverty and persecution are rampant, the presumption is that persons must migrate in order to support and protect themselves, and that nations who are able to receive them should do so whenever possible. In other words, 
The state's right to control borders is not absolute. But it is only legitimate, and it, or, but it is also legitimate when it supports the common, common good. All right, so that's the key background. So what about the American circumstance today? Um, uh, 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 this was written in 2004 when there, that was, I think, three attempts at immigration reform ago. Um, all right. So there's a certain paradox in America's, uh, the, the United States of America's immigration system. On the one hand, the U.S. is uh, by far um, uh, one of the most welcoming nations in terms of the raw numbers, uh, one, of the, one of the most welcoming nations on earth, um, with by far the largest number of immigrants legally admitted each year. Um, although the U.S. is fairly average among developed nations in terms of uh, yearly admissions, in terms of percentage of the population, um, uh, there are smaller developed nations that admit, you know, a, a greater percentage. Uh, on the other hand, the U.S.'s complex, the United States of America's complex immigration laws favor some groups over others, leaving many with the most, those who have the most incentive to immigrate effectively unable to do so legally. Um, so in Strangers No Longer, the bishops bring this up and they fault the current U.S. immigration system uh, for making it more difficult uh, for the poor and those with the greatest claim to the right to migrate, like those who actually have a need, who are in a situation where they, they need to come here, um, it's made more difficult for those folks uh, with the greatest claim to, with, for the right to migrate to enter legally. Although relatively uh, generous in the number of visas offered, uh, U.S. immigration policies is, is heavily weighed uh, towards those least in need uh, of a new start on life. Uh, in particular, uh, preference is given to the immediate relatives of U.S. citizens, uh, those who are highly and those who are highly educated, and frankly, those who are wealthy. You could buy your way in. Now, uh, uh, of course, we should admit that uh, uh, people in those categories, the wealthy, the educated, and those who have relatives uh, who are U.S. residents, um, but uh, the bishops advance that we should also provide greater opportunity for those who are most in need, those who are fleeing something, who have an urgent circumstance where they're exercising their human right to migrate. So this mismatch between the priorities embedded in U.S. immigration law and then the, ma the makeup of those who uh, are actually trying to migrate to the U.S., this is the primary driver of um, uh, illegal immigration in the United States. Um, someone, some folks would advance even further that there's a, a, there's a deeper flaw or a, a, a connected flaw uh, in the current system that both family visas and work visas for permanent residents have, a per, con have per country gaps, meaning we'll accept uh, you know, uh, this, this number from X, this number from Y, this, this number from Z, meaning that no more than 7% uh, uh, of any year's visas are given to people of any, uh, of, of any one country. Now, despite that fact, the, the fact that the vast majority of people seeking entry into the U.S., are our near national neighbors, um, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. So res the result is that even though those who do qualify to immigrate legally from Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, they're forced often to wait 10, uh, 10 15, 20 years um, because of this mismatch between supply and demand. So that was produced in, in 2007 and the Catholic bishops have continued to uh, speak on this uh, explicitly and indirectly. Uh, they've continued to update their teachings over the years, uh, most recently calling for a series of reforms uh, to the broken U.S. immigration system uh, just um, two years ago. Uh, for example, they advocate for an earned legalization program uh, and temporary worker programs with appropriate worker protections. Um, greater efficacy in the handling of family-based immigration cases, uh, the restoration of due process for immigrants, uh, especially those who are undocumented. And the USCCB has argued in, uh, um, uh, what, uh, what is the term? Um, uh, uh, provided uh, uh, amicus brief, did I say that right? Amicus brief. And, uh, amicus briefs, um, uh, that all undocumented persons in the US should have, quote, opportunities for a safe home 
education for their children and a decent life for their families if they're here and have called for an end to the practice of separating families through deportation. Um, uh, do I want to talk about that? Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll hit the pause button on there. Okay, that's the current circumstance. Um, so uh, in one of the emails uh, Brian and I exchanged over the summer, uh, Dr. Pedraza asked if I could, uh, I could somehow connect uh, immigration and health care. Um, now there is a parallel between care for the sick and the welcome for strangers. And it, it was fun to sort it out and, and, and to tease it out. Um, um, uh, uh, and I think this is most clearly, we see this most clearly, when the welcome of strangers and care or those who are ill or sick is understood as outward acts of the virtue mercy. So for folks who spend their time thinking about health care, uh, as many of you, this might be a helpful way to approach a contemporary Catholic engagement uh, with the US with US immigration with the US immigration policy debates. So reframing the conversation. You can pass off on from that. Reframing the conversation. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas on mercy. So, um, there's an important difference between, on the one hand, the distinctively Catholic vision of the common good and just immigration reform, which I've just described. Uh, this, these proposals, this vision, the, uh, is offered as a gift to uh, all persons of goodwill. There's a difference between that and, on the other hand, Christ's personal address and call uh, to an individual on, along their path uh, of discipleship. These are two different things. Um, uh, now, I don't want to be misunderstood with this. Catholic social teaching is indeed an integral part of the evangelical witness of the church in the world, absolutely. And further, Christ calls us to do good works so that the love of God will be manifest uh, for those who do not believe in the world. Now the difference I want to emphasize here is the traditional scholastic distinction between human law, uh, these are uh, rules we develop uh, to govern the common life, reasoning about the natural law, the difference between the human law and, uh, and the law of the gospel, it's sometimes called the new law, where the saving and sanctifying grace we receive in Christ is manifest uh, by a faith that's expressed externally through acts of love. Two laws, human law, derived from the natural law, and uh, the new law, the law of love, the law of the gospel, where our faith is performed and manifest uh, through outward acts of love. Now, all law, in this way of thinking about law, uh, whether it's natural law, just human laws, uh, the divine law, both old and, and new, these all participate, participate in, a, uh, in the eternal law of God. Uh, so there's not, these aren't opposed to one another. Uh, the way the scholastics thought about this is these are all, these are all integrated and extensions. There's, there's one lawgiver, and that's God, and there are different ways of participating in this. Um, now, what I want to suggest is that the contemporary U.S. Catholic conversation around the pastoral, practical, political, international challenges of persons migrating uh, excessively to the U.S., that U.S. Catholic conversation, it gravitates towards puzzles about human law, the rules that we develop from the natural law to figure out how we can live life together and get along. Now this is important, uh, this is an important conversation, and Catholics have a responsibility to participate in that, offering uh, what, uh, what we have to the national debate. Uh, this is faithful citizenship, to offer this for the common good and for the well-being of our neighbors. That being said, I think a lot of confusion and a broad spectrum of muddles could be avoided if Catholic Christians recall Christ's call to discipleship. It's the difference between, on the one hand, public arguments about what the basic rules of society are and how they should be enforced, and on the other hand, a personal decision to follow Christ along a path that goes beyond the rules, because the rules fall short of what we're called to by Christ. So to illustrate this a little bit, so or this rules versus this form of life, this distinction. So uh, do not worship false idols. It's a great rule. I, I, I advocate keeping it. Um, but idol avoidance is not the point 
of that command. The point uh, of the command, do not worship false idols, is a form of life that follows the rule but goes beyond it. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the purpose of the rule. Another rule, uh, do not murder. Also a big fan of that one. Uh, uh, it's a good one. I think we should keep it. But the point uh, of not murdering is something more complex. Uh, I don't walk around saying, oh, God, you got to make sure I don't murder anybody today. I'm not worried about murdering people today. That's not the point of the rule. The point of this rule is a form of life that follows the rule but goes beyond the rule. Uh, the command to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the point. That's the purpose of the rule. So rules are always a good place to start. They're always, this is why we give them to, to our children, to middle school students. Here's the rule. Follow the rule, uh, but you've got to understand the heart of the rule, the purpose of the rule, and what it's aiming towards. The rules are a good place to start, but Christ calls each of us to something more. He calls us to something more, a flourishing form of life, an ongoing journey towards ever-increasing happiness, which is our presently imperfect participation and the final happiness that we're all longing and hungry for, the happiness of beatitude. So St. Thomas Aquinas, um, I'm a fan of St. Thomas, as you learned last night. St. Thomas, in his reflection on that form of life and Christ's call to discipleship, he has something to say that's directly relevant to the practical and political challenges of migrant persons hoping to come find a home here in the U.S. He does this in his treatise on charity, where he observes that, well, charity, uh, love of God, is the greatest of all the vir virtues simply uh, because it unites us with God. Mercy, misericordia, is the greatest of all the virtues concerning the love of neighbor. These are connected, our love of God, our intimacy with God, our, uh, our bond, binding to God by way of love, is the source from which our love for neighbor flows. Um, uh, so mercy is the greatest of all the virtues pertaining to love of neighbor. So with that in mind, and with the help of St. Thomas, uh, I'd like for us to think about mercy. And this is where I'm going to spend most of our time, uh, uh, for the rest of our time. Uh, uh, charity makes us like God. Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, in the tradition, it's called deification. It's our, the perfection of our likeness to God. We love God. We draw closer to God. We sink deeper and, and more intimately into the goodness, truth, and beauty of the Creator, the source of our own being. We're united to God in love. That's what charity does. We become more like God. Nevertheless, or I guess in addition to that, as an expression of that intimacy with the Creator, as an outward performance, uh, an uh, overflowing of that intimacy with the Creator, the virtue mercy, this particular kind of excellence, it perfects our likeness unto God with respect to a similarity of works. We become more like God in action when we are merciful. We become more uh, with charity, we become more like God through the bond of love as we grow closer, draw closer to the sense of source of our own being. Mercy is how we most perfectly imitate the God who revealed his love as mercy. This mercy is how we act like God. It's how we imitate God. So just as we come to know the love of God through God's merciful regard towards us as we suffered, mired in the wounds of original sin, uh, we most perfectly imitate the God, uh, the God our, create, God our Creator, uh, when our love is extended in merciful regard toward the suffering of our neighbor. Okay. So, mercy. Let me give you a quick, let's see, how are we doing on time? Hmm. Yeah, all right. I might, I might summarize some bits. Okay. So, mercy... Uh, for St. Thomas Aquinas is described in basically two ways. He makes a distinction. It's a passion. It's a movement. Um, uh, uh, you can almost you can call it emotion, an emotion. It's a movement of our body. It's a central uh, grief uh, when we recognize uh, that another human being is suffering. 
So it's, it's a movement of our bodies. And this movement, is, uh, when our bodies, uh, when our, uh, our passions are moved in this way, um, it's not irrational. It's actually based on judgments um, about the severity of, the, of, of what is suffering, uh, uh, about the fault, uh, the blameworthiness of the person who is suffering, uh, and a matter of personal identification. Um, it's not an irrational emotion. It's a, it's a thoughtful recognition wherein we're then moved <coughs> And we feel sad, we feel broken. And we have different words for this emotion. Uh, pity, uh, pity, that's kind of Aristotle's language. Um, uh, uh, pity, empathy, sympathy, compassion. Um, uh, these are words for that emotion. And it's an unpleasant emotion. It's one that you, you're familiar with. Um, on the other hand, he talks about mercy as a virtue. Mercy as a virtue is a rational decision, a disposition to act upon that grief uh, in a way that is thoughtful and reflective. The virtue mercy, this excellence of mercy, is what, you, what do you do with that emotion? Where does it go? How do you perform it? How do you, how do you enact it? Even when nothing can be done to relieve the suffering that we recognize in the other person, upon recognizing the suffering of another, the heartfelt misery of misericordia is a settled disposition to do something. Uh, 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 or more precisely, it's an inclination that I must do something. I need to address this. So the virtue of mercy is the moral impulse to personally address any, in, uh, uh, the physical or the spiritual cause of the experience of evil by removing the cause of the misery or by providing for what is missing. Uh, in, in the case of a person who's suffering. So understood in this way, the virtue mercy is oriented towards a, a particular set of external acts. And we know these acts as the works of mercy. Uh, I usually, uh, when, when I'm with my students, I, I'll say, I'll give someone $5 if they can say uh, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Someone always tries, but they always forget bury the dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, another word for the for the for the uh, corpor cor uh, corporal and spiritual works of mercy is, is alms deeds. Um, uh, to quickly uh, uh, describe them, uh, uh, so the corporal works of mercy, the seven corporal works of mercy: feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, harbor uh, or give shelter to those who are homeless, uh, visit the sick, uh, to ransom those who are captive, and to bury the dead. Now think about something. Each of those works of mercy, the corporal works of mercy, has a lack. There's something that's missing. There's something wrong that's recognized. Uh, uh, I see this person, something is missing. Something's, there, there's, it is causing suffering in their life. So having recognized this, the work addresses, uh, uh, either mitigates the pain, removes the cause of the pain, or, or, uh, uh, or at least gives comfort. So what's, uh, feed the hungry, what's missing? Food. Uh, you drink to the thirsty, well, water's missing. Uh, uh, clothe the naked, well, uh, they're cold, right? Um, they need clothing. Uh, uh, shelter the homeless, uh, they, need, uh, uh, they need a safe place to rest. Um, uh, it's uh, or, uh, uh, har harbor the harborless, um, to give them safety. Uh, visit the sick, or well, what's missing, uh, physical health. Um, a ransom uh, the captive, or uh, the physical freedom, that's what's missing. Bury the dead, what's missing in the case of bury the dead? Uh, I, mean, I think, in my reading of uh, the tradition, it's respect for the body. That, that, the cor the, that final corporal work of mercy is respect for the gift of our body, that this is the body that carried that person, or, the, or that this is that person's close, intimate way of being in the world. Now, the other seven, the spiritual works of mercy, which are often overlooked, unfortunately, are to teach the ignorant, so um, to address a lack of knowledge, our understanding, to counsel those who are confused, um, basically how to go on, it's practical knowledge, how to. Now the third is to admonish the sinner, uh, basically to give, for someone who lacks moral sense, to say, hey, this is the difference between right and wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry no one ever taught you that, but this is, this is where you go. Uh, shape up. Um, to comfort the afflicted. Uh, what well, what's missing? Well, spiritual well-being. Uh, uh, to forgive wrongs. 
Well, what's missing in the, in, with the forgiveness of wrongs? Well, uh, nearness, community, spiritual unity, the unity of, uh, of, of siblings, of family. The sixth is to bear wrongs patiently. What's missing in that case? Um, well, what is a person who's just a pain in the butt that's hard to put up with? No one wants to be around them. What they're missing is uh, not spiritual connection. They're missing human connections. It's to be patient. And then finally, the seventh spiritual work of mercy is, is to pray for the living and the dead. Uh, what's the lack there? Well, it's respect for the spiritual aspect of our being. It's, it's, it's beautifully mapped. And, uh, it's, I think it's an underappreciated underappreci- aspect of the, of, um, of the Catholic moral tradition. Um, so an impo- it's important to underscore uh, 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 that, that the uh, emotion and the acts of mercy are always predicated upon, they arise from one's ability to recognize evil, one's ability to recognize that something is wrong. And the ability to be moved by that misery, that emotion, uh, to help uh, that, the human being, uh, the, 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 the suffering human being. So throughout the question on mercy, St. Thomas Aquinas, he formulates a, a constellation of prudential judgments necessary uh, to, uh, to an act of, of mercy. Uh, uh, what he says, it points out, is that this act of mercy is both uh, directing both the passions of the sensitive appetite, uh, so how our emotion should be directed, and also the operations of the intellectual appetite, so how we think and how we feel. So when, uh, when this is working well, when we have this disposition. We're thinking right, we're feeling right. How we feel is informed by good thinking, and good thinking is informed by this, this powerful emotion we feel. This, this all goes together. So because this heartfelt misery is moved uh, by, uh, uh, by the signs of evil that we recognize uh, as being suffered by another person, uh, this affective inclination, this, this emotional disposition, of those confronted by human misery, this is fundamental for performing the works of mercy. In other words, if you, the person is unable to feel this emotion in the right way, the right time, or is un- unable to recognize or understand an instance of human suffering in, in, a, in a way that's coordinate with what is true and good, uh, there's, there's gonna, some, the works are going to get messed up. Uh, uh, you got to be able to recognize it. Now, here's what's interesting about this ability to recognize, because it's both something you think and it's something you feel, is that these can be screwed up. You can misunderstand what you see. You might not understand the fullness that you might lack information, or you may be interpreting what you see uh, in the wrong way. Um, how you feel may also uh, also may not be exactly right because our emotions can be misdirected, they can be twisted, malformed. We can desensitize ourselves to all kinds of suffering. I, I, um, I, I usually talk about The Walking Dead with my students, a, a zombie movie, a zombie show. Uh, <laughs> now, but the ability to recognize evil, to recognize that someone is suffering, that it is true suffering, it's, uh, uh, it's severe, it's not their fault, and then to recognize the unity of how we are connected. Uh, all of this is something that is like a skill that needs to be developed and habituated. In other words, uh, we, uh, if your mom and dad didn't raise you right, uh, uh, you may not be able to see it. Our, your parents could have screwed you up. Your culture could have screwed you up. It could have made you incapable of recognizing the suffering of others. This is a reality we must learn to see. And one of the, what we're get, among the most essential elements we're given in the tradition is, uh, is, uh, is the crucifix, the contemplation of the crucifix, um, of the suffering of Christ. Uh, uh, the church fathers and, and mothers, uh, in contemplating, in contemplating uh, the, cru- uh, the image, the icon of Christ crucified, uh, often go to that as uh, understanding that this is how we understand uh, what suffering is um, and how we learn to see rightly. So 
For Aquinas, the ability to recognize evil as evil and human misery as an instance of an evil suffered, it's an inclination that's acquired through habituation, communal practices corresponding to what's good and true. And because of that, you, we can be screwed up if we were not raised right. So when it comes to the performance of these acts, the works of mercy, um, far too many Christians, it could be argued, have been affectively conditioned. Now, our, our emotions and our thinking about what we perceive, uh, we've been conditioned uh, through desensitizing media, technological distractions, uh, uh, insulating cultural customs and social customs. Uh, we've been conditioned into a state of moral disorder, uh, an affective moral disorder, where we can't recognize the suffering of another human being because we don't understand and we can't feel it the way we ought to. Now, from the perspective of the individual moral rectitude, um, this, uh, the, the, the word that we would apply to this in the, tr in the tradition is called asadia, sloth. Uh, it's a kind of indifference. It's a, it's a kind of moral blindness to human misery in this case. Um, uh, and this, uh, some would say, um, uh, I, I, well, I, I think well, St. Thomas says this, uh, this is worse than misanthropic hatred. It's actually worse than hating a person. Because at the very least, uh, those who hate they still recognize the humanity of their enemy. This is what makes Asadia so, so dangerous and so scary. Let me say a little bit about it, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move to wrap up. So, uh, strictly speaking, the radical inversion of merciful neighbor love, it's not contempt or abuse of the poor. It's habituated indifference to truth and goodness. That is the real threat. That is the thing that hurts them. It's habituated indifference to truth. It's habituated indifference to the good that's expressed in this uh, emotion of compassion. So the vice of asadia, or ascetic indifference, let me just define this a little bit. Uh, Maybe you'll recognize it in your life. I certainly recognize it in mine. Um, uh, this is the, one of the deadly sins. Although every vice has its opposite uh, uh, to a certain spiritual good, um, uh, the vice of asadia is uniquely opposed to the divine, the divine good of charity. Asadia, sloth, is opposed to charity, love, the love of God, um, which overflows into love of neighbor. Understood in that way, asadia is not the mere recognition that there are difficulties associated uh, with our participation in the love of God and our extension of love of neighbor. Rather, asadia is a dispositional despair at the fact that moral goodness and our participation in the, in the, the divine good, that is demanding. It's a despair. That this takes work. It takes work to learn, to relearn things and to learn to recognize the truth um, that others are, are introducing to me. It takes work to, uh, to wrestle with your emotions and say, you know what, I may not be responding. Everyone else seems to be moved by this, but I'm not. Ah, I'm not gonna deal with it. You, you go be your weep, weeping, weeping warrior. I got my life to do. Uh, you, uh, you all think that way about human suffering. You know, I gotta stay focused on my thing. Um, so Aquinas uh, suggests that revulsion at the moral good, uh, 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 at the moral good, and the truth of the divine good becomes habituated indifference um, when the lack of joy in spiritual pleasures is, suppl is supplemented. When, when our joy in spiritual pleasures is supplemented, uh, basically replaced by intemperate sensual or bodily pleasures. This is where he thinks that we how we can malhabituate ourselves. For example, the sensual pleasures attached to gluttony, uh, to drunkenness, to lust or pornography, uh, anger, um, curiosity, the wandering of the mind after unlawful things. All of these uh, go towards desensitizing us. They're the quick path, well, the path to uh, ascetic indifference, to this vice of sloth. 
These are all ways to avoid the sorrow of a dispositionally unhappy life. That is to say, the despairing sorrow of those who live a life bereft of the fundamental happiness that is mercy. The greatest of all the virtues uh, pertaining to love of neighbor. So, to wrap things up, here's my claim related to this notion, uh, not my people, uh, not, not my problem, a phrase that maybe uh, you've uttered in your heart, that I know I've uttered in my heart at times, this attitude. My claim is that when it comes to the Catholic Christian understanding of mercy in relationship uh, to, to, to care for the sick or in relationship to uh, welcoming of the migrant, I contend that among the works of mercy most urgently needed today in our time is to address the specific kinds of lack suffered by those who are capable of welcoming strangers and attending to the sick, but who don't. Because there are those three, first three spiritual works of mercy. The first three spiritual works of mercy to teach the ignorant, to advise or counsel those who don't know have practical wisdom. And that tricky third one, to admonish the sinner, to correct those who lack moral sense. I would want to contend that in the case of these immigration issues uh, and these challenges that are being navigated, uh, maybe we need a different kind of work of mercy, uh, education uh, of those who are not moved to act, who aren't feeling it, uh, who don't understand. In other words, the problem of migration is not the stranger on our doorstep. The problem of sickness is not the sick person. We are the problem. We, we create the problem. Sure, there are strangers among us who need the specialized knowledge and skills of medical practitioners, and there are strangers among us who need, uh, um, who need uh, uh, the, the specialized knowledge and skills of those who welcome them. That's obvious. What is less obvious is the way the practical performance of that corporal work of mercy, how it's twisted and impaired and undermined by factors unrelated to the knowledges and practices of welcoming and, and of caring for the sick. So as I see it, um, uh, this is a helpful way to think about the challenges and puzzles in the contemporary um, U.S. immigration debate uh, because it points to uh, our discipleship to Jesus Christ. It's like, yeah, you know what, those are big puzzles, big problems. And Catholics need to have a voice in that. Let's adjust immigration reform. But Christ calls us to something bigger. Uh, yeah, do that work, but that's baby steps. Rules are easy. Rules are easy. We're called to follow Jesus, where he went. And where did he go? He went to the margins. He went to the least, the last, the lost, the forgotten, the disenfranchised, the abused, the alienated. That's where Jesus went. And that's what we have in the moral witness of St. Francis. Um, that's all I got to say. Thank you very much for welcoming me here at Franciscan University. Let's take a few moments to extend the conversation. Do you have any thoughts or questions of your own? Hmm. I see a clear tie between your, your image today and your image last night. Mm -hmm. The marginalized how we serve them and serve the world. Yeah. It, it, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah yes, that's true. That, that's correct. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, that, that, that that's a, of all the things, that that's the thing that stuck out to you the most. Um, uh, it's sobering to me when uh, St. Thomas says that the greatest of all the virtues uh, 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 pertaining to love of neighbor is mercy. Uh, that's, that, that causes me to, uh, to pause. Like, how merciful am I? Um, I am a lazy dude sometimes. Uh, there are just some sort of problems I would rather not know about, um, even though I could do something. And there are some uh, emotions I would rather not feel uh, because who has the time? You know, I'm, I'd much rather do the, read, read this book or, or watch that watch that TV show or um, enjoy my 
many privileges and luxuries we, we enjoy here in, in, in the U.S. Um, this is why it matters, at least to me. I'm trying. I I fear for my soul. Uh, yeah. Maybe that was a little too much. <laughs> Remember the, the iconic picture of that little four-year-old, was it three or four-year-old child that was washed up on the Italian from the immigrants trying to leave Africa. And I'll never forget, it was in a conversation, it was in just a publish eyes, you know. And this guy said, well, that's what they get for trying to leave their country. No. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure I want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> you know, in the sense, how you, you can't educate. Uh, you can try to say, well, but you know, that was their fault. They shouldn't have tried, blah, blah, blah. They should stay in their own country. And it just, my heart hit the ground. Can I, can I comment on this? Yeah. So for that, that image itself, um, those, those little shoes, that, that's, that was the same age as uh, my little boy at that time. Ooh. And I saw those little shoes, and my, my little boy, uh, he, had, he had little shoes just like those shoes, and oh, I was wrecked. I bet you did. <clears throat> but that person, that individual, um, here's what I think uh, Saint, we have in this vision of St. Thomas, and, and maybe a gift that can be reappropriated from the tradition, the spiritual, um, uh, the spiritual works of mercy. That is a pitiful way of moving through the world. That is a very sad way of moving through the world. Um, it, we, should be moved, uh, we should be moved with compassion, um, uh, sympathy uh, for a person who's so confused about what's good and true and beautiful that we feel moved to act. And like, you know, I, I, I get being a, a, angry and upset with people who like say those kinds of dehumanizing things. But like, if there, if we got anything, uh, uh, if we receive anything from Jesus and the good news, it's that uh, the greater wound is sin, right? Like, we're, we're, you know, we our bodies hurt, but the deeper wound is sin. Okay, so this with this person suffering, uh, what mercy does this? What, what mercy can I give to this person? Uh, instruction. That's one. Instruct the ignorant. Give guidance to those to counsel those who don't know how to go on, uh, but also uh, to admonish the sinner. It's wrong. You, uh, you, you lack moral sense. Um, your mother didn't raise you right, and I'm so sorry for you. Yeah. Um, let me introduce you to my mother. Uh, um, blessed mother of mer mercy. You know, um, uh, let, let, let me introduce you to my mother. But see, that I'm not always wired like that. I... I I have a chip on my shoulder about all sorts of things, um, but I do think that's the hard, that's a more difficult kind of work, and I think it's scary work. And I asked him. I said, "Do you? If it was your child, well, I wouldn't put my child in that kind of situation. So I kind of just try to help him look at it from another perspective. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point too where all it does is says, "Well, yeah, yeah, but you see, that's what your job is talking about me." because you're a, a bleeding heart and all this other stuff. And you try to be kind, but <laughs> I, I try not to show. I'm an extrovert. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> but um, I, I, it was my thought behind telling that, but mm -hmm. it's just difficult. Yeah. And being in Haiti, I mean, I saw, I saw be, uh, a human being beating bloodying another human being and laughing. And you know, the, and it challenged me to be able to, how then can I counteract that or at least out of love show something else. But again, being the extrovert that I am, I had to constantly remind myself, be an instrument of peace. Mm -hmm. or make gentlest way possible but yeah I mean when that that guy said that I mean all this horror from what I saw before I'm glad I didn't have a baseball bat yeah you know yeah <laughs> because how, how it's hard to instruct 
a heart that's so damaged. Yeah, well, and, and we have other avenues. Uh, forgive wrongs, bear, forgive wrongs. bear wrongs patiently. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. this is this is tricky. Um, uh, I'm not sorry. Were you finished? Yeah. Um, when, uh, like I mentioned, like uh, integral to this understanding of the works of mercy is that it's resp um, is responding to a lack. But you also you can't give it if you don't have it. Uh, if you don't have water, you can't give water. If you don't have food, you can't give food. If you don't have clothing, you can't give it. If you don't have extra clothing, you can't give it. If you don't have shelter for yourself, you can't give it. Um, uh, if you don't have the knowledge. Uh, you can't instruct. If you don't have uh, the wit uh, practical know-how, you can't help someone know how to go on. If you do not have moral insight, uh, uh, you uh, can't, uh, you can't, you don't, you don't have more, you don't have moral wisdom to give. But, so this is where within the tradition, the, the Catholic intellectual tradition, there's a unique challenge is then to cultivate um, uh, uh, um, understanding, uh, to cultivate practical know-how, and to cultivate moral sense. Um, and I'll return to my final point. I think this is a work of mercy that's needed today. I think we need uh, more people who uh, administer these spiritual works of mercy uh, on these particular topics, that those who have the knowledge that, uh, that, they, um, uh, that they do the hard work of ministering to the ignorant among us, uh, to, the, to those among us who have no moral sense. Um, as a, as, a, as a missionary ministry. We go feed the hungry, we go give drink to the thirsty, we go clothe the naked, but man, what about a missionary enterprise to the racists among us? What about a missionary enterprise um, uh, to the poor, uh, 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 to, to the sad people who are in a circumstance where uh, they laugh at a dead child on a beach? They need mercy too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe even more difficult yeah. missionary ministry. Yeah. Um, to go out and yeah. Too. yeah. What I appreciate about um, what what you said, I, it, what it, it 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 returns us to the call to follow Jesus, the very basic call to call to discipleship. Um, but in like the circumstance, we'll just take the 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 puzzle and the problem of contemporary U.S. immigration policy. I is like it's we want to argue policy. And like, do this, and here's this system, and here's this plan, well, what about this, and here's another way to think about it, and here's this, uh, uh, here's this juridical theory, and here are these principles, and um, here's these, this set of numbers. You know, that's where at least the Catholic pressure sometimes seems to go, and I think it's good, it's important, I, I don't think we should give it up, it's part of our moral witness in the world. Um, but that thing, the other side of it, uh, I think we, we have maybe lost touch with that. Um, uh, uh, not entirely. But I also think that's just part of the work that needs to be done. It's, another, it's, a, it's a parallel work of mercy. But it all begins with discipleship. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I, too, want to thank you for the fact that you've been participating because it means so much for young people like yourself who are participating in the
Bearing the wrongs of others. Yeah, please, yeah. So there's like, one of the things that is beautiful about the way St. Thomas does this. Um, uh, he there's a parallelism the way he talks about the, the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. Uh, we could give food in a way that enables um, uh, uh, poor behavior. Um, we could give shelter in a way that enables poor behavior, and that's uh, 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 so. And, but like uh, on those elements, we have like okay. Like, what, how do we discern? How do we know when we're giving too much food? How do we know when, hey, maybe I shouldn't be giving food right now. Um, maybe they don't, maybe it's not sufficiently serious, their need, or maybe their circumstance, uh, it's, it's their fault. Maybe it's serious, but it's, uh, um, uh, uh, but it's not their fault, or it is their fault. Um, uh, that is what makes this a virtue. The, this is why mercy is a virtue. It's, uh, it's rational thought, thinking deeply about how do I respond to this emotion? Because the emotion is real. The emotions, if, if a person is well formed, you're going to be moved, you're going to be shaken. If you understand and your uh, affective disposition is, is in good order, your, your mom and dad raised you right, uh, but knowing how to respond, uh, there, are, there are ways of thinking about this, uh, uh, how we uh, discipline uh, our response. Uh, sometimes called like, they're like heuristics you can go through. So we can ask yourself questions. It's kind of an examination of conscience. Um, uh, St. Thomas has one that's really great. He, he talks about, about alms deeds. Uh, uh, in essence, uh, he, he asks, like, in, in this circumstance, is, is, it okay to, uh, is it okay to give? Can I give uh, money out of, uh, from ill-gotten goods or gains? Right? So money I stole, should I give that to the poor? Um, uh, what about in the case of someone who got that money because they were a prostitute? Uh, is that money uh, uh, something that can be given to the poor? Well, he would say, yeah. That's like that, um, he would say, yeah. But if it was received from a bribery, it's like, no, no, because that money uh, uh, should be go, go another direction. Um, if it was stolen, it's like, no, it needs to be returned. Uh, but these are just ways of thinking. But it's, what it means is we have to be part of a living conversation about how to do these, perform these works well. And I don't know if we have on these particular points. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Well, it's something that, for me, is um, uh, problematic often in um, social dynamics, especially now, in that what I think you may be, and maybe the cynic in me, sorry, um, uh, drives me to um, see ulterior motives, but what is Yeah. Uh, extra help or something. Um, and I often get folks feel all but I, you know, you're an awfully mean spirited individual. Yeah. But as you said, the emotions are real. And um, I, I worry a little bit about um, bandwagon approaches to compassion mm -hmm. and whether, and when it becomes a bandwagon approach, Genuine. Yeah. So what you're putting your finger on is one of the uh, most ancient, oldest debates about this emotion we have in the in Western intellectual tradition. Um, it's a debate around pity. Um, uh, to, uh, to summarize it, let's see if I can do this in 45 seconds. Uh, you have a pity tradition uh, uh, exemplified in Aristotle. This is, you know, this is an emotion uh, that is, uh, uh, binds us to, uh, to one another, and, and it comes from rational judgments about what's the case. Is it serious? Uh, is, it, uh, is it their fault? And do I identify with them? 
and this is the, and this is the emo, uh, this is the emotion. We can act well upon that if we're magnanimous. Uh, so that's the pro pity position. But there's an anti pity tradition. It comes from Socrates and the Stoics. Um, uh, their understanding of um, uh, of what it means to be a human being and human excellence is that we're perfected through our reason and our will, and the body is less important. Um, anything could happen to me, and that we um, not only uh, we uh, we undermine. Oh, it's an affront to the dignity of a suffering person to offer to help them. It's insulting because a truly excellent person um, wouldn't accept the help, the help, the handout. And, but and further, it's a, a yeah, uh, on this stoic view, it's like yeah, crap happens all the time. Parents die, tornadoes happen, floods happen, uh, hurricanes happen. Uh, you, you break your leg, you throw your back out. Uh, crummy stuff happens, but. If you are truly cultivating uh, the uh, reason and will, you will be, the Stoics, you will be unbreakable, unmovable. So a truly excellent person, even amid the, the circumstances of life, they don't need it and they don't want it because they're unbreakable. So it, in, in within this that alternate anti-pity tradition, uh, it's, uh, you can, sure, give a handout to those who need it, but it's almost an insult. To them, um, and it'd be better for just to cultivate a circumstance where we don't do that. So, in both cases, both of them agree that um, that this emotion uh, comes, that this emotion emerges in us. We have, we feel moved to act, um, uh, and they both agree that there are judgments there about reality, uh, about it, whether it's deserved it or not, about whether this is. Um, uh, 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 and, and on the other hand, whether this is a good emotion or not, and about what it means to be live a happy human life. So these two treads or tracks um, are uh, thousands of years old, and uh, the church has, in some circumstances, wrestled with this. The modern version of this we have it comes through Nietzsche. Um, uh, his his he considered uh, the mercy uh, the, the mercy. Uh, the compassion of Christianity to be one of the greatest insults there could be. That this was the reason. It was, it was a slave religion. It was a religion for slavish people that promotes the cause of those who were not strong enough, who didn't have the will, the strength uh, to be the, the Ubermensch, the, uh, to be the ones, the masters of the universe. Um, no, you need to get rid of it. On the other hand, you have uh, St. Francis. Uh, on the other hand, we have, well, we have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the God who is love, who uh, shows his power through his mercy, um, through his ability to care. And further, uh, uh, um, allowed himself to be subjected. To the is there not misguided mercy? So you're at... That, will, that can really encourage that kind of stoic thinking. Yeah, I, I would say so, and this is where... Um, Going back to the, the early, early point, Martise, Martise uh, we need to talk about this, and we need to have, uh, like within the, within the church, is it like, great public policy, super duper, let, let's let's talk about all those things, all these problems we can solve. We need to uh, uh, those of us who are, who are Catholics, those of us who are Christians, we need to get together. We need to like wait a minute. Okay, what's the difference between doing this well and doing this not so well? Uh, paying attention not just to what Scripture tells us, because script, what Scripture gives us this is a revealed word, but thinking deeply and wrestling with it in light of these different philosophical systems and frameworks that we receive from culture, uh, from society, from history, uh, and from all the ways our attitudes and mind is shaped. Um, there's an opportunity here, and I think a great need to have uh, a more substantive conversation that is connected to the centuries, to, to millennia of Christians thinking about this. We think that this is a new problem. It's not. Like that's like, like we think we just invented this, <laughs> with this puzzle. Uh, that, that hey, maybe there's maybe I'm uh, I, I'm just missing this person if I give them too much food. Uh, this is an old question. I, we're not that original. Uh, thank you for that. But I think you're right. You put your hand on a on a on a, on a puzzle. Yeah. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, uh, it's, uh, prayer is always good. Uh, 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 praying, praying for, praying for prayer, uh, bearing wrongs uh, with tolerance and forgiving others. Those are the three most accessible of the spiritual works of mercy. Anyone can do them. Um, uh, yeah. Y'all, if you would join me in thanking Dr. Thank Romero. You so much. Feel free to stick around, enjoy some of the refreshments, discuss with one another. I actually want to